welcome everybody and hit the record button. So one thing I like to do when I hit the record button is show you this so that in case somebody can't hear me, they can see that I am recording this session and it will live on the YouTube channel some point. I like to show my website. If you like um, what you see, I do teach other things too. And if you wanna tell me something, just email me and it's sandy at acedogsports.com. So if you have feedback, um, this is uh, Ace Dog Sports um, answer to COVID called pay if you can learning. There's a sliding scale and a donation button on my website. And some folks don't like to use PayPal. So they email me and they get my um, address and they mail me a check and the sliding scale is uh, uh, on the website and it's also on the end of every single one of these that's posted on the YouTube channel. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna dive right in. Um, again, welcome to uh, Wednesday Night Live. I am Sandy Rogers. My business name is Ace Dog Sports. I'm gonna share my screen now and um, just review, which we're gonna do every week. I'm, me thinks it can't hurt. Um, Becky, can you see my, you can nod. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay. I think I'll mute, mute myself though. Okay. Um, so this is course maps, love them, don't leave them. This is my opportunity to remind you that if you do not like course maps, if you have an aversion to them, I meet lots and lots of people at all different levels that flat out have aversions. I have heard all kinds of seemingly compelling reasons. Those reasons are very, very real to those people. None of them are good enough to not get over. You got to get over your aversion to the course map. It is just too valuable. I'm going to have everybody double check right now that they are muted um, so that we don't uh, get interrupted. So I talk um, about the phases of the walkthrough. Some of these phases can be um, uh, done mentally on the course map. Some of them can be done half and half as the course builders are building. Um, I just, I like getting, I like to flirt with those courses. I like to know as much as I can, even like, I know this is going to sound so weird. I hate to say it, but it's even like the colors of the jumps where they are in proximity, because when I get out there and I'm running my dog, I am so focused on the path between the obstacles that every once in a while, if I haven't let what the obstacles actually look like, when I see them, I feel uncomfortable as if I'm lost a little bit. So I familiarize myself with the obstacles when the course is being built, but I digress. So learn the course as a course. That's the phase one. First thing you're gonna do when you see your course map long before the course is built. I want you to remember that it's not about you or the dog. Boy, does that sound weird. Geometry is geometry is geometry. So what I'm calling geometry and the way I teach and the way I do it is a very effective, efficient way to go about approaching course design, decision-making, course walkthrough and handling decisions. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit more about um, geometry in just a second. Phase two is the decisions. The decisions are in regards to sides. What side of your body is it most to your advantage for the dog to be on? The skills required for the side changes and the turns and the directions as well as the obstacle performance and the lanes that you travel in and that the dog travels in. So those are the decisions that have to be made. At the end of the day, every agility handlers 
goal should be that they can turn their dog to the left or the right whenever they want from either side of their body as well as cue the dog to go straight. If you can turn your dog to the left or the right, no matter what angle you're on from either side of your body, you're gonna get through most courses just with those things. Phase three is more about the walkthrough, but you can't really talk, you can't talk about course maps and course design and how to use course maps without eventually talking about handling and um, the precision walkthrough. And that's because, da -da -da -da, here comes the big incentive to, for embracing course maps. I want five full minutes for my precision walkthrough. That's my dress rehearsal. That's where I'm out there in the eight minute walkthrough at the competition. And I am going from obstacle one through the last obstacle, which is either, you know, somewhere between 18 and 21 obstacles at the advanced levels. And I am pretending that I have my dog with me and I am rehearsing roles for my mouth, my hands, which include my arms, my feet, which includes my hips and my eyes all based on where my imaginary dog is. So that's what I call a precision walkthrough. I want five minutes for that dress rehearsal. That means when I hit that course, when I hit the walkthrough, I wanna make all my decisions, sides, turn cues, everything in three minutes. That's a tall order. But if I have identified on the course map and the places that require it, I can go directly to them. And then does that happen for me? That's a, that's a, see this big word right here? It says goal. <laughs> I, want, I really want you to understand that this is just a goal. If I don't meet my goal, all that that means is I don't have to be too upset with my dog or I if my run doesn't go as well as I would like. For my run to go as well as I like, I need five minutes for the dress rehearsal. Then my chances are higher and higher. If I get caught in decision phase and that number goes down, I could still have a lovely run. I could still have a spectacular run. I could still have, or it, it's just a percentage. It's just gonna go down a little bit. That doesn't upset me. That's, that, that's fact. Do I ever get caught in decisions? You betcha. The point is, if I do as much as I'm going to show you, <laughs> which is a lot, with my course map first, that, that, goes, that goes down. So um, I'll thank you now for coming. Sometimes we go over a little bit. The uh, session ends at 7 if you need to go. Um, uh, you know, you can say goodbye in the chat if you like. The chat is open. You can put questions in the chat if you like. Um, I'm also okay with being interrupted, uh, unmute and say, Sandy, I've got a question. And, um, uh, oh, I know sometimes while you're typing, I change subjects. Don't let that be a cue to you to delete what you were typing. Just because I've changed subjects doesn't mean I can't go back. So all subjects are open once, uh, and, and you can change the subject with a question because I, it's easy for me to say um, that's another seminar or something like that. All righty, we're gonna do just a little bit more um, uh, work with geometry tonight. So this just takes a second. There we go. Can everybody see what looks like a big red arrow? Thanks, Becky. Okay, class, this is a jump. Those arrows heads are actually wings. The dotted line is a refusal 
line. The refusal line is an imaginary line that cuts the jump in half. It's the same as the bar. This is the bar of the jump. These arrowheads are the wings of the jump. To me, the geometry is a twofold issue. One is the direction I want the dog to take the jump. So my dog could start here. Um, let me see if I can tell who, somebody isn't muted and we can hear you. So everybody that can hear me quickly check and be sure that you're muted. It might be caller in use that's on a phone. So I just drew a dot and just because my dog leaves the ground there doesn't mean that my next on course obstacle is over here. So I might act, my next on course obstacle might be over here. So I might want my dog to do that. In which case I need his spine to take this far in a different way. So when I'm talking about line setting, I'm talking about the way your dog's spine would be on approach to that jump. I talk about the information zone a lot. That information zone is an area before the jump. It's actually before all obstacles. Sometimes it's way, 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 way before. And I've had some folks recently think that the information zone is like always eight feet from everything or always 12 feet. Because when I've said depending on the dog, it's not just depending on the dog, it's depending on the course, the momentum, the speed. It's basically, if your dog could vote when he wants to know what to do, how to take the bar. So line setting is part of geometry. The difficult part about the geometry, I mean, all of you can see easily that if, you're, if your ju next jump is here or here or here, depending on where your dog is coming from towards that big red jump, you're going to have to do something to, to get him so that it, when he lands, he'll end up facing the right way. That something is a cue to go straight or a cue to turn. And then we love to have all kinds of different ways to teach our dogs to turn. That's in the handling seminar. Here's the next bit. I'm going to start fresh here. Here's my same jump. So now we know that GM... The first part of geometry is um, which way, there's your wings, we'll make them different on this jump, is which way the dog takes the bar. The next thing is whether or not, these are your wings, this is your refusal line, is whether or not your dog needs to wrap a wing in order to stay on course. Sometimes the next jump is on the takeoff side of the jump. So this could be takeoff side and this could be landing side. So the dog would take off, land, come around the wing and take quote unquote, the refusal line in order to come back to a jump that's over here. So the geometry in this case, is it better to go this way around that jump or this way around that jump? And a lot of people will only look at the way that's apparent or the way that is the easiest. 
current course de design in our sport, clever little judges that they are, are often now making that a smoother transition for the dog if the handler has to do more work to go the other way. So that's just something you're gonna to have to trust me on and we'll see more on the course design. There's another way to wrap a jump and that's called the backside where the dog takes the, ref he's still wrapping the wing. All of, all of this that I'm talking about involves a wrap of one kind or another. So we just talked about a wrap where the dog takes the bar and then the refusal line. This is also a wrap where the dog takes the bar and then the refusal line. But the dog might also be asked in the course design to take the refusal line and then the bar to come back. In which case you would have to look and see if it's gonna be better for your dog, not you, to take the refusal line and then the bar. So I'm not saying that the, you have, I mean, sometimes a jump can be bi-directional in some things, and that's what this would mean, that you could take the jump in either direction. Almost always the judge has told you, you must take the jump from this side, or you must take the jump from that side. So um, this is when it gets a little trickier. And it can be identified on the course map. Any questions about that? You may have to unmute and say, yes, I have a question because I can't see everybody when I'm screen sharing. Going once, going twice. Okay, so this is a UKI um, course. UKI is typically international handling. Real tricky course, lovely, very lovely um, course with some very subtle things I thought it would be fun to look at. You guys, I printed extra copies of it. So if it starts to get too scribbly, just tell me to, that you'd like me to, you know, get put a clean one on like your clean placemat and I can do that. Except for I just threw it on the floor. Okay. So I've just picked up my course map. The course is not built and I'm just going to familiarize myself with it. So I've got one, two, three. Remember the number is always on the side of the bar. Four, five, hmm, I say to myself. Six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 20 feet to a backside, that woke me up. 20 feet to a backside with a threadle, now I'm really awake, and 19. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look for the sake of class tonight, at the jumps that have the second part of the geometry that I was talking about. So you should be able to tell, I'd like to have some toothpicks, but I don't have any toothpicks. You can already tell that your dog could take number one completely in a direction that could set you up to an advantage to take number two. So that's a no brainer. So number one, you are the dog is not taking the bar and then the refusal line. Number two, the dog is taking the bar and then another obstacle. He's not wrapping the wing in any way, shape or form. For number four, he is also going directly from the bar to another obstacle. He is not wrapping the wing in any way, shape or form. So, so far we've just got lines and lanes. Number six, the next on course obstacle is technically on the takeoff side of six. This is the takeoff side of six. This is the landing side of six. 
if we drew a line here and chopped our course map, that next obstacle is on takeoff side. That means there is next second, second level geometry. I will have to decide if I'm going to wrap my dog around this way or if I'm going to wrap my dog around this way. You guys, in this one, it's like a no brainer. It's obvious, as Suzanne said today. That's good. That's all well and good. It is, but they all aren't. And the problem is, is if you get in to the habit of thinking, let me, let me put it another way. I work with folks that are extremely experienced that don't, that are wrong <laughs> when it, it's not obvious. So I make myself look, even if I think it's obvious. I don't trust obvious until I've proven it to myself. That's the way to say it. Because I get caught out too much. And right now I'm just, I'm just fact finding how many of these decisions do I have to make? So I can see that th going around this way, see the dog takes the refusal line way over here in this case. So he's not doing this, but if we did that imaginary refusal line forever, the dog is taking the bar and then he is quote unquote taking the refusal line. And I'm gonna give you some tips for handling that. Can anybody yell out the configuration of six to seven? Two seventy. Yep. Okay, now seven to eight. Is the dog taking the bar and going directly to an obstacle or is he taking the bar and then a refusal line? Bar to refusal line. He has to. He has to take the bar and wrap the wing in order to get to eight. So our question is, are we going to go this way or are we going to go this way? So now we've got two and that one, that one is not so obvious. And the reason it's not obvious, this is all facts, ladies and gentlemen. This is, this is not anything to do with the dog or the handler. No one should be thinking about handling whatsoever. This wing is closer to that jump, end of story. This wing is further away from that jump. So there are gonna be people that are gonna look at, it will be easier to handle this wing, but it will be a crappier approach to the A-frame. Don't panic, it's just a fact. That's all there is to it. If you stand here, it's a straighter shot to the A-frame than if you stand here. The dog would have to turn to get onto the A-frame. Okay, A-frames, tunnels, and weave poles um, pretty much have to be taken. You don't get to angle. You don't get to say, I'll, I'll make you go that way. Just trust me on that one. Okay, nine, does the dog take the bar and then the refusal line would be my question. Yes, he doesn't take the bar and then go to some other obstacle. He takes the, the dog will take the bar and immediately take the refusal line. And because number 10 is on takeoff side of nine, that says I've got to look at whether or not to go this way or this way. If my dog goes this way, there's that much of a turn. If my dog goes this way, there's that much of a turn. The dog is coming from here. So is that less of a turn than that? The answer is yes. This is less of a turn. This wing is further from the A-frame, but closer to the tunnel. So these are the questions when we talk about the handling, is your dog turning tighter to your advantage? Well, it doesn't shorten the distance because it's shorter here, but longer here. Can a dog run a tighter circle faster than a less tighter circle. No, you don't have to think about it. It's not faster to go tighter. 
unless you have a tiny dog. So, and, and you guys, there's other reasons too. And we talk about them every week and I'll remind you, what if I have a dog that is built in a non-flexible way? And that dog has trouble turning tightly, mentally and physically. If I keep asking the dog to do something mentally and physically difficult, uh, there's very few animals that aren't taxed mentally when they're asked to do something uh, physically difficult. If I keep asking the dog to do that, they could start slowing down on the entire course. So I absolutely teach that you have to know your dog very, very well. And there are things that can override the basic geometry. All I'm saying is you got to know it. You got to know what you're overriding and why. And maybe some of those dogs, you could get away with one strategic tight turn or two strategic tight turns, but the rest of the time you're better off going, especially if the line difference is minimal. Okay, so we've made no firm decisions. Hallelujah, hallelujah, something logical and easy and fast, uh, uh, 10 to 11. 11 to 12, no wrap because 13 is on the landing side of 12. Now, how we're gonna, if we, if we don't do something on inf in the information zone on approach to 12, our dog is gonna, should think he should go to the weave poles. So we gotta say, whoa, the, your next on course obstacle is over here. And then 13, the dog does have to take the um, bar to the refusal line. Let's see, let's check me. Mm -hmm. Not technically. I love smart judges that do angly stuff like this. So the dog I'm upside down, you guys. Give me just a second here. 13, 14. We don't have a wrap. We've got bar directly to bar. 15, we do not have, we don't know exactly where the, how the dog is gonna land on that bar yet because we haven't figured out our lines and lanes. 15, 16, we've already talked about this. Again, refusal line to bar or refusal line to bar. You, nobody's gonna go over here to get back to here. This, because, because this is closer and easier. And it's a tight turn with the backside either way. But you do have to decide if you're going to go around the wing this way or if you're going to go around the other wing. I call these donuts and S's. Is it going to be better for my dog to take to go in an S? or make a donut. This is just back to what I was talking about a second ago about tight turns or not. Will my dog be lined up better for 18 this way or this way? Is my dog a Chihuahua, a Great Dane, a medium speed Border Collie or a medium speed um, uh, anything, Labrador, Sheltie, you name it. Cocker Spaniel. So this is going to take some, some, some figuring based on my dog skills and my skills. And then I'm going to go out over 19. So this wing is a lot closer to, so again, 18, I can look at going this way or this way. And the way that I know that I'm obligated by um, course design law is because 19 is on takeoff side of 18, which means a wrap is employed. 
okay? So now with this course, you guys, beyond just figuring out how I'm gonna stay on course, and beyond deciding which side of this mess I'm gonna be on, I'm talking three, four, five, I've gotta make these decisions for these wraps and I should be able to do it on the course map. I have to double check that the obstacles are where they are. And um, I'm just gonna tell you for my dog, I my preference would be to go this way and make this nice smooth line. Because when my dog comes around number 17 this way, how do I know which way to go on 17? I look at 19. You guys, if you could stand here to the middle of next week and see that you could get from 17 to 18 and see that you could get from 17 to 18. And I see people ringside going, well, I, you know, I can get there. It's not about that. It's about that if you take your dog this way on 17, your dog will be taking this far this way. And you've got more of a turn on your hands than if your dog takes this far this way, then he's got less of a turn to get to 19. So what you're looking at on the way you go on 17 is how the dog's spine, how his body will be taking 18. And if he takes the jump this way, he's better lined up for 19 than if he takes the jump that way. Okay, so now we've got uh, geometry here and here and here. And I think that's all. Let me get a clean piece of paper for you. Okay, now let's decide what side it's better to be on. And I never start at the beginning because where I'm going to do a lead out depends on the first strategic handling spot that is gonna be difficult for me to get to because I have to decide if I must be there or not. So I wanna know if there's some strategic spot that I must get to that, my, that where I stand on my lead out will either promote or prevent it. So you guys, sometimes there will be something in this case very, very, very tricky at the very end. And I might have to plan to steal two feet here, two feet there, two feet here, two feet there through the whole course in order to make that. I do that one just a little farther away and I'll be up just a little further ahead than it looks like I really need to be. And I'll send just a little sooner to that tunnel and I'll leave just a little bit earlier because I'll keep yelling tunnel, tunnel, tunnel. My dog won't notice that I ran the other way because I'm doing that. So it's, it's um, training and handling. So the first big thing for me on this course is what side of four in relationship to what side of five, because I would really like to put the dog into those weave poles with the dog on my left. So I would like to, so here's the lane. There's what I want my dog to do. And I would like to be on this side for the poles because there's no candy down here. There's no there's nothing to draw my dog. By candy, I mean other obstacles. So if I have my dog on my right, I'll have to keep him on my right until it's time to um, tell him to go right, or I'll have to make a side change in here. So my preference is to have the dog on my left when he goes into the poles, because I can control the entry better. That's a fact. I have no idea if I have a way to do that or not. 
I do know that it won't be easy because it would require, because I, I know that I'm handling jump one on my left. So I need my dog to go into three from two. Okay, that's a decent line. So that means I need my dog to get to here to take two, because if my dog comes to here, he could take the wrong side or here or here or here. So small percentage of handlers would set their dog straight on to jump one. And then if they blink or sneeze or weight shift, it'll be anybody's guess to which side of jump two they're gonna get. So I would set my dog at an angle. So this would not be what I would do. So that my dog would take one like this and end up out in this lane. Now, I've, now this buys me a little bit more freedom to be here. If I do my side change between the tunnel and the jump, I'm gonna be queuing these obstacles because that's what I do. I put myself on the quadrant and this is in the, the four key things in the YouTube, the YouTube channel has the, the lecture on the four quadrants. If I'm here, that means, so my four quadrants of my jumper here, if I put myself in this quadrant, it means my on-course obstacles in that quadrant and it is not. This is the on-course obstacle. So I can, if I've got this weave pole entry trained, some people are like, that weave pole entry is not a problem. I don't need candy down there. I can just say poles. My, but the dog, you guys, and the dog could come out of this tunnel and take the wrong side of the jump too. So I've got to call the dog in and if he takes this jump like this and I yell poles and my dog isn't trained to say, oh, I just don't go in anywhere, then this is hard. I'm gonna have to keep the dog on my right. So again, I'm still motivated to put the dog on my left and I don't think a side change here will work because that wouldn't be in my system of communication. Now the side change will work if I'm in this quadrant of the jump. And again, these are the four quadrants of this particular jump. I know it's getting a little messy, just hang in there with me. So, and this, this entrance to the dog walk is a problem too, because if I'm stopped here, stopped is a magnet, and my dog comes over this jump, he could go there, but it wouldn't take much to have him not because he's, he's, I mean, he, if he goes wide here, I mean, shit happens, it could happen. So now I want to think to myself, if I lead out to about here and I push on that line just a little bit as my dog is coming over one, making the backside obvious, could I just yell, go on tunnel and run here and possibly do a blind cross. That's a lot of distance. That's almost 20 feet and a 15 foot tunnel and another 20 feet. But if I'm running this way, as my dog comes out of the tunnel, I could cue the backside. So now that means, can I run and rotate to talk to my dog to make sure he takes the bar this way and do the side change? I'll have to walk it to know for sure, but this is why I have to use the course map. So I know I'm not gonna side change here because it'll be a quadrant lie. So now my choices are when I get out there, I will have to look at how close these things are. And if I am going to have to keep the dog on my right and then flip him off of me to turn into the weave poles. The other thing I could do is what's called an ugly front cross. There's no off course obstacles here. I could just let my dog do that jump, call him to me, wrap him around, put him on my left and do the poles. See, this one's complicated, I told you. 
So now let's see if this map is a little cleaner on this side, it is. So now I know that once the dog starts weaving, whether I cut behind him and do a rear cross because I put him in on my right, or I got that side change done, which I am gonna have to feel, which is all determined about sending from here and getting to here, which isn't that far guys, that, that is not that far. And then I'm gonna do, I've got uh, six, I've gotta decide if I'm gonna wrap this way and put the dog over the bar that way or if I'm going to wrap this way oh wrong way sorry guys this way and put the dog that way or this way so you guys for sake of time and argument this is actually a very lovely line the dog exits the poles, pretty, 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 pretty. Still haven't thought a lick about how the heck I'm going to do it. But because I can see how nice this is, I have enormous um, incentive. Same exact philosophy goes here. Um, Hmm, here's something we didn't see. If I go this way, my dog has less of a turn into the tunnel. That's way more gradual than going here and then turning and then turning again. But this turn is a complete donut. So you guys remember last week how I said with a tunnel, I'll look to see if the opening, these are tunnel openings in case you're wondering, if this hole is a little here or a little here or a little there, I wouldn't make that decision on this jump until I saw, because if that tunnel was a little bit like this, I very well may go this way. But it would, this line is so nice and smooth I would hope that tunnel might be a little bit this way. And then it's like, yeehaw, no brainer. And uh, it would take a lot for me to want to crank the dog down that tight when I could get this. But I am going to take that into consideration. I am definitely handling the dog walk on my left. There's no advantage quadrant way to, to, uh, to have the dog walk on this side. And let me see. I got that number 12 jump pretty musted up. So now we're going 12, 13, 14, 15, 11 is the dog walk, 12, 13, 14, 15. That geometry is now complete. There's, that's just um, classic out, in, in. So this is not a classic uh, serpentine. If it was a classic serpentine, it would be out over the 12, in over the 13, and that jump would be taken that way. So this is, uh, this is just a, a 180. The, I know the jumps are tipped funny, but that would be how you would handle it to a backside. And now you've got to know how far up here you can get a backside. You guys, there's nothing wrong. This would be so simple to be about here. This wing is dictating how deep I want to go in. Just do a bit of a send till 12, come across this jump and be in a nice place right here, handler, to do a backside to a pull. And um, uh, rear crossing the teeter is something a lot of handlers will avo avoid. This always gives me incentive to go home and train some rears on the teeter because the rear is probably the best bet there. I would walk a front cross. I would see if these jumps were a little tiny bit closer together or I may be able to get a push to a front. That's something I'm going to have to check on the course. I would not um, go very far past 
the end of this uh, teeter. If I had to run on this side of the teeter, maybe the teeter was over here a little bit more, adding some distance. My goal would be to be here in technical cert position. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. It just means past the 50% point of the teeter to let the dog know I'm now in this quadrant of this obstacle, which means your on-course obstacle is there. I wouldn't be over here and do a push. Um, I hope I'm not losing anybody here. I want, I got to send the dog to the tunnel and then my lane, the tunnel's definitely going to be on my right. So you guys, what a lot of people would do is they would end up too close to the tunnel. And as the dog was exiting, they would start to run towards the wing and they would be traveling inward and the dog would travel inward and they would get that bar. So what I'm gonna do is stay hella close to that teeter so that when my dog comes out of that tunnel, he feels my pressure coming across. Now I'm not gonna end up here I'm not going to end up here. And you guys, this is now this is just a foot race. We call straight tunnels puppy cannons. They're puppy cannons. The dogs just shoot out of them. So however far you can get up here is going to determine if you're going to do a landing side front cross. That will not be me. That's 25 feet. Now I am going to send from here. So my dog is going to have to travel 15 plus 20 and I should be able to be up here, but I am pretty sure that I would do one of two things. I would SERP. This is where your training com comes in. I could run along here, cue my backside and SERP this and rear 18 and have 19 on my left going out. Some people that are fast or then they're faster than their dogs could send and get up here and do a front cross to a threadle so that they would technically be doing this jump on their left, threadling, technically doing that jump on their left and technically doing that jump on their left. So now I know the places where I need to do strong sends. I know the geometry and I can just get out there on that course real quick, walk it once to make sure these questions, where are these actually? where is this in proximity to this actually and see if anything's different. Questions on this course? I'm gonna take a drink of water. Pat? Candy? Yep. Yeah. Um, you've lost me on the quadrant business. I don't know if I slept through that part or. No, what? I can do that really quick. Really, 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 really quick. So I did a lecture on this once. I wrote an article a long time and the article has a really stupid name. It's like the four somethings. And when I did it, it was one of those things, you guys, most of what I teach, I have honestly done with hundreds of dogs over decades, hundreds of dogs over decades. But every once in a while, I'll come up with an idea that I'm pretty sure works as much as I think it does, but I haven't done it with hundreds of dogs over decades. So I wrote that article probably five or six years ago. And I, um, I more and more and more and more love it. So here's your jump. And uh, here's your wings of your jump. So we all know about the refusal line. Those of you that train with me know that I also talk about the space of the jump. This is all the space of the jump. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just clarifying it for those of you that hear terms. So now here we have the jump again. These are the wings. What I'm talking about the four quadrants, Margaret, 
is taking that jump and cutting it in court, uh, quarters. When my dog is in the information zone, I want to be in whatever quadrant the next on course obstacle is. That's why I'm crazy about SERP position. That's why SERP must be 50% over across the bar. If your next on course obstacle, if you're coming from over here and your next on course obstacle is here, you can't be in this quadrant. You can be, but you're going to T bone your dog. And, it, and I'm finding with my dogs that if I work really hard, that is like so easy on them. Oh, she's there. My next on course obstacle is on, whether it's takeoff side or landing side, we'll call this takeoff side. If she's there, my and so he already knows he's gonna wrap because I wouldn't be there if the on course obstacle wasn't there. It's, it's just another way to talk about positional cues. Did that help? No, let's talk about it next week. <laughs> okay. So the question is, are you in the quadrant of the next on course obstacle? So if my next on course obstacle is a jump here, I would want to be in this quadrant. If my next on course obstacle is in here, then I'd want to be in this quadrant. If okay. my next on course obstacle is here, I'd want to be in this one. And when is where? When I want to be there is where my dog is. When my dog is in the information zone, the information zone is the spot the dog would like to have the um, information. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I said it a few different. I've said it a few different ways, and this is something you know we haven't walked courses together in so long, Margaret. You have to come up. We'll have to do a half day of just training because we've been doing puppy stuff for so long. This is just handling jargon that's morphed a little bit since we've worked together. Who wants to do novice? <laughs> Yay. The people that me, are me, me, me. huh? Me. Good, me. good, good. Me too. So I picked, this is a recent course. I got it off of the, um, one of the, um, really, that's not gonna happen. I, hope I brought my dog to work with me today. So lots of, there's lots of tunnel starts um, these days. Um, this is kind of nice because, um, you know, that with COVID and with ring efficiency that you're usually start and end on different sides of the, of the um, uh, world here, course, different sides of the course. Notice six bowls. Notice tire, notice broad jump, notice table, the forgotten obstacles. You guys, I hate, I hate it when my students or I get hung up on a tire, a broad jump or a table. I feel like I have to go to confession or something. Okay, dog is going. If the tunnel is set like this, but remember that little hole might be here, it might be here, the exit hole is what we're wondering about, but the dog is going to shoot out like that. So there are dogs that could miss that number too. Okay. The weave pull entry is going to be difficult or hard depending on where the dog, how the dog takes two. So if the dog takes two like that, <laughs> or like that, then then that, that's what it's it's funny because people go like, well, that we pulls entry's not too bad. Well, <laughs> if your dog comes shooting out of the tunnel and you scream for him and he barely makes a jump and he takes the bar like that, <laughs> that we pull entry might be really hard. But guess what? If he takes the bar like this. That we pull entry is now pretty civil. So you have real incentive to take your dog on this path. People think that they that there's nothing to do there, and there is, there's plenty to do there. 
And then the dog is going to do this. So he's going to exit like that. And if we don't do anything too crazy, that should be doable. I would want my dog hearing the name of this obstacle as soon as he goes in there. Only one way that's going to happen if I practice, if I think about it, if I think about it and I practice doing it and I practice it in the walkthrough, I do have a snowball's chance in hell of it actually happening. But if I forget to do it, I don't practice it in the walkthrough, then I'm not gonna hold myself accountable. I, I didn't do all the things that it takes for me to remember what to do. The sun will come up tomorrow. Okay, five. This, I like dog walks because it contains the dog. <laughs> I don't have to, I guess if I'm way behind, I could, no, yeah. Okay, don't, don't relax anywhere, worry everywhere. If you're way behind and your dog is worried about you because he loves you, he could come off of the dog walk sideways if you've got a stopped. He could also come off the dog walk sideways if you've got a running. So um, hopefully you're gonna be up far enough ahead or your dog is gonna be trained well enough that he's stopped. Again, you guys, this is what my brain is doing as I'm, as I'm doing the course now. If your dog goes flying off the dog walk or you've got a running and he lands way out here, this is a significant turn six to seven. This is, this is only 10 feet, gang. So even though it doesn't look hard, you, you know how when you're driving your car and the road is curvy, you got to brake before the turn? <laughs> If your dog takes this at optimum speed, it's not going to be to your advantage, right? He could end up over that one. He could run around this one. So you are going to have information zone for my dog would be here where I'm going to have to start telling him to break or collect or slow down so he can make this turn. And then what you need to know is your dog has to get onto the table from this side or this side. Oh, and novice, it might not matter. At some point in your career, it will matter greatly if the dog runs around and gets on this side. So you might as well just teach him and practice handling him taking the straight approach here. You guys, I'm gonna give you a little outside tip here. If you're ever walking a course and the approach from the jump ahead of a table shows you the corner of the table, you can say to the judge, I'm a little scared for that corner of the table to be point, poking at my dog's entry. Most course builders and judges, that stuff doesn't really happen too much anymore, but you can see that this table is set to be very specifically with a flat side to that jump. All right, now when your dog's on the table, you can position yourself however you want to be. So our dog is going to come off the table and take that jump like that. But unfortunately, the next on course obstacle is over here. So we need that much of a turn. This is only five feet. And guess what's talking? You know what tunnels say? Here, kitty, 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 kitty. So this turn is also not a gimme. This is a tight turn. Um, your dog could be running. And if you're pushing on this line, there is also a bit of a turn here. So it's important if you want your dog to go like that, that you go like that. That's called paralleling the path. And your broad jump has these little markers does anybody else hate those little markers? So your dog has to take the broad jump like this. If he jumps through the markers that way or approaches like that, it's it's no good. It's it's you didn't perform the obstacle. So your dog should release and you know this is relatively fine, but he's going to jump long. The broad jump is is long and low. So you can't, and if this tire's down here a little bit, sometimes when you walk the dog's path, you'll see, oh, the tire is, 
you know, a little bit more obvious. I can't tell when my dog comes off that teeter how obvious this tire is from the course map. Looks like it shouldn't be a problem, but at the end of the day, that's only 10 feet. So I've got a plan queuing the turn to 13. When my dog takes 14, he'll be taking it like that, but my on-course obstacle goes that way. So again, in the information zone, here for a super fast border collie, here for a little old chihuahua, I've got to cue that turn. And this is a place that's so, you know, you guys, you just, you just want to notice this is a double jump, which again means the dog is going to take it big. And, and if he's not working on his own because he's a baby, maybe, yeah, he could run right around that. Oh, yay, mommy. And what happens to mommy when she's clean up to here? She quit handling. She's all happy. And the, do you know how many times dogs run around the last obstacle? Oh, yucky poo poo. A lot, a lot, a lot. So the other thing that handlers do, so tip of the day on handling, I would not pass 14 for love nor money. This is quadrants. I, I would cue D cell from takeoff side. That's handling. Sorry, not, not uh, quadrants as much. But my I, if I pass this jump, it means I that I'm going to something over here. So if I want to cue what I already determined was a tight turn, I would not pass the wing of this jump. So I know I'm going to be handling here. And I also wouldn't just run to that tire. Oh my gosh, so many people do this, you guys. Oh, I can't do that. So if I just run to the tire, now I'm paralleling this path. So again, if I want the dog to do that, then I am going to do that. I take paralleling the dog's path very seriously. Sometimes when I run the last obstacle, I'm the only footprints over there. That's the reason why so many bars come down. So my turn cue would be on takeoff because it's a tight turn and I don't pass jumps unless I want dogs to go straight or turn big. And then I could just go right down that, that lane. Now I get to do what I want to do. You guys, when I get to do what I want to do on a course, I, I, I don't want to say I forfeit my right, but I'm happy to let go of my concerns over whether or not it's going to work. When my, when I, when things don't, any questions on this course? We're at 702. Any questions on it? Oh, that's open. We don't have time to do open. Questions? Any general questions? I don't understand why you would. What if your dog won't ever? A blind cross is when the dog can't see you. Is that the idea? And you're changing over a different direction? It's when you can't see the dog. Oh, okay. So a blind cross means you're crossing the dog's path. And when you do, you show the dog your backside. So if I was blind, oh, you can't see. Um, So if I was blind crossing these two jumps, it just means I would have my, I would run like that if I was front crossing. So the dog is going to take this jump and then this jump. So there's a side change required. So if I was blind crossing, I would just run straight. I would just simply no fuss, no muss run that way. And my goal would be that I would be on this side. I would be done crossing the dog's path. There's the crossing point. 
way before the dog was to this point. If I was going to front cross, I would change sides by doing that. So my butt is showing to the dog for just a second. And there's just a second where I can't see them. The th confusing thing about a blind cross is you must be way, way, way ahead. And you have to be further ahead to do an effective blind than, a, than an effective front cross. The pros of doing the blind is it's three steps less and no rotation. The cons are if you do them badly, your dog will learn to cut behind you. Oh. And by badly, I mean late. So if I did it after the dog had landed, the dog would think that he should stay on my right. And then I, and then I would skedaddle and I would call the dog up to my left. And he'd go, oh, sometimes when she accelerates, she's going to want me to cut behind her instead of you just magically being on this side before the dog even gets to this jump. So that's training and handling. And um, so when we have a side change, so that's one of the one of the things you guys that's my students would be like, I don't know how to, I don't know how I'm going to get over there. And it's like, well, how many cues have you trained that create a side change? You've only got as many as you've got, and you got to use one of those. Flying cross, front cross, rear cross. And then there's others too, but every one of the others is born from one of those three. Questions? So you guys can email me if you're liking this stuff, you can let your friends know. And um, yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Love it. Thank Love you. It. Thanks, you're welcome. Andy. Thanks for Thank coming, you, you guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. Thank you.